I'm Jordan Thorne and we're here at TMRE 2021. Today I'm joined by Katie Gross. She's the Chief Customer Officer at Suzy. Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So maybe we could start by having you tell me a little bit about yourself and your role and sort of what Suzy's all about. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a lifelong market researcher, having uh, studied psychology at university. My only marketable skill when I came out of university was SPSS. So uh, landed in a market research role at a food and drink company. Um, and then have been mostly in online panel companies um, in the number in the last kind of number of years. I moved to the USA about ten years ago um, and joined Suzy right in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, it was fantastic. Um, I uh, I think during kind of recessionary times when there's a lot of turbulence with consumers, people need very fast feedback very quickly. Consumers' habits are changing rapidly and uh, Suzy is a great platform to, to enable brands to really kind of get to know their consumers and uh, get that rapid feedback. Incredible. Can you talk a little bit about the new product innovations that the team has done in 2021? Yeah. So Suzy is only three and a half years old. So we are rapidly developing, rapidly creating new products. And in 2021 this year, we have launched a number of new services and products. Um, one of those being um, iHut, so in-home usage testing. We had a lot of clients who used to do you know, central location testing, who wanted their consumers to taste test products and so on, how to shut it down during COVID. Mm. So we developed very quickly a product that enables um, our clients to send products to consumers. We can then obviously do follow-up surveys with those consumers um, to understand more about the packaging, the needs, the tastes, um, et cetera. Um, and we have also leveraged a new service of ours called Suzy Live, which is um, okay. digital in-depth interviews with consumers. So you can now take them from the survey into an in-depth interview back into a survey. Amazing. And uh, we've really kind of like come full circle with in-home usage testing and that it's not just a follow-up survey, but actually have an in-depth conversation with those consumers, whether it's one-to-one -one or yeah. focus groups as well. Really so. interesting. And how do you see clients using Suzy? So we really kind of straddle all four pillars of market research. So a lot of our clients are using us for foundational research. So who is the consumer? What are their needs? What are the drivers and motivations of purchasing and behaviors? Um, they will then take that information and start conducting a significant amount of um, concept testing. So we do a lot of innovation work. I actually had a client just last week who said that uh, the insights industry is not short of ideas. They're short of the ability to be able to throw bad ideas out. So okay. He had 80 concepts. He put them all into Suzy and overnight kind of like whittled out 40 of them and went, okay, these are bad ideas. So innovation testing is really uh, a really big component of what our clients use us for. Um, and then ad testing, copy testing, concept testing um, for digital ad campaigns. And then really through to kind of shopper um, analysis and understanding yeah. the kind of drivers and uh, how that shifting um, consumer kind of channel purchasing is, uh, has really evolved over the last year. Oh, you guys seem to do it all. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's never a dull day. <laughs> right? Um, can you talk a little bit about CrowdTap and how having your own panel unlocks yeah. different things for your clients? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think one of the reasons I, I joined Suzy, um, having come from panel companies for most of my career, Suzy owns its own panel. The, the, so the consumer facing brand is CrowdTap. Um, the panelists, uh, the respondents, and members. Um, join, it is a, a game changer. So having our own panel enables us to do many, many things. Number one, um, we're always iterating with those consumers. We actually ran a segmentation recently on our own panel. So okay. what are the motivations of them belonging to CrowdTap? What do they enjoy about answering uh, our client surveys um, and so on? Um, but owning our own panel means that we can recontact with respondents very frequently. We can segment the, the panel um, against our clients' typing tools or segmentation, tagging those respondents. So when we're running a survey, it is typically only kind of seven questions on average um, for, most of our, uh, for most of our surveys because we already know their age, gender, region, ethnicity, demographics. Um, segmented behaviors, et cetera. We've already asked all that information. Yeah. So we're not having to kind of labor the respondent with 25 minutes worth of questions. <laughs> um, so the data file has significant amounts of information. The respondent themselves are answering the questions that are most relevant. Hmm. And you've recently talked about um, the gender question in one of the most recent presentations. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So everybody, or many brands kind of, 
neglect sometimes the, the thought that the, the survey itself is a marketing touch point. Mm. And so even though it may not be branded with the brand, consumers and, and panelists typically know what you're asking questions about. It's typically yeah. about the brand. Um, it is a marketing touch point. So we started noticing that particularly with Gen Z, when the first question is, please select your gender, male, female, respondents were really feeling like it was not an inclusive question. So mm. although they themselves may have identified as male or female, um, they felt the question was not inclusive and they actually X out of the survey altogether. So, um, so we were concerned that not including um, everybody meant that we were excluding a lot of people and we were excluding allies um, as well. So we could go male, female, other. We could go male, female, preferent to disclose, but actually we decided to do some research. So we asked our own panel. Um, we had 10 different versions of the gender um, and sex question um, and we put it to the test. So mm. we did our own research basically um, on our respondents. And we found that the question that was most inclusive for both our NatRep panel and also our LGBTQ plus panel was male, female, um, other, and preferent to disclose okay. as well. So really give somebody the, the, the option to, to yeah. um, identify the way that they want to identify. Um, it re that question resonated not just with the LGBTQ plus panel, but again, as I mentioned, like allies, yeah. etc. Um, and our, our CrowdTap members really felt that that type of question made the brand feel a much more inclusive brand and that mm. they wanted to hear all voices, not just the yeah. voices of uh, people identify male, female. That's really incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we, as we talk about, you know, the gender questions, what practices can brands take on board to really address inclusivity beyond the gender question? Yeah, exactly. I think we're really, we're in a place where um, we, we, we have historically have been in the market research for a very long time. We have asked gender, ethnicity, income, and we have kind of really just made assumptions on bucketing people um, based on some of those. Our client yesterday, Fran Guzman from uh, Kraft Heinz, mentioned that he himself um, selects the Hispanic box in a survey, mm. as do his parents. Okay. Um, he's second generation, his parents are first generation, and he really states it. It's very misleading because the behaviors, attitudes, purchasing behaviors, drivers' needs are incredibly different. Mm. And so I think we've really done ourselves a disservice by assuming that people can be um, kind of bucketed into demographics and um, in the kind of the old school way of thinking about it. And it's it's time to really think about what are those drivers, what are their needs. Um, a parent is a parent, yeah. like, regardless of um, regardless of their ethnicity or, or gender. Yeah. And how do you think brands can create surveys for gender fluid consumers who recognize the need to be including more than just the male, the female? Um, how can that potentially get better insights? Yeah, so I think for some, some of our clients, have just stopped asking gender at all. So okay. there's, a, wow. there's a lot of products and brands that are really, there is no difference between um, purchasing behaviors and needs and drivers based on um, gender. So they've just mm. kind of said, we don't need to segment. So we don't even ask the question anymore, which I think is incredibly important. I think surveys can often feel laborious because there is 10 minutes of demographics that no one uses. Yeah. Um, so I think, first of all, should you be including demographics at all? If they're not relevant, don't ask them. Um, and second, I think it's about thinking about your brand as I'm trying to be inclusive and I want to hear the voices of everybody. And so, as, again, as I mentioned, even though somebody may identify as female or may identify as male, they want to ensure or they want to make sure they're giving their feedback to a brand and that brand is an inclusive brand. So right. even just seeing the question expanded beyond just male, female yeah. or beyond just ethnicity is a, is a really key marketing touch point um, yeah. that for, makes sense. for the brand. And how has your team uh, been embracing or emphasizing diversity, both in sort of your team as well as within the market research? Yeah, so I think we can all unfortunately say the market research industry is not diverse. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been in this industry for 20 plus years now and we struggle. I've, I've been in many conferences, many rooms where the majority of folks are Caucasian, the majority of folks um, are, are male or female identifying. And I think it's about employing and growing the right talent, the right people. Um, first of all, sometimes I, I will read a survey that has been um, written by a particular socioeconomic group or a particular gender. And I'm kind of like, I think we're missing, we're missing a lot of topics um, yeah. uh, or attributes, for example. So I think we need to attract more 
um, diverse talent into our industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we need to grow that talent as well. Um, I think people need to see on boards of our companies that there is a lot of diversity of ethnicity, socioeconomic background, gender. Um, and I think that we have, we have a long way to go, I yeah. think, in the market research industry. So we, Susie, um, are not just really looking for great talent, um, but we are also very, um, we, we do the hard work but beyond our culture. So. Recently, we have um, had a lot of company all hand meetings um, on demystifying diversity, where we've had to do the hard work mm. of um, of understanding our own drivers. Um, we we did book club recently on um, the book was um, sorry, no, don't worry, don't worry. mind blanking on the name of the book. Um, subtle acts of exclusion. Okay. So we had to redo really the the hard work on when have we been. Um, victims of kind of subtle acts of exclusion when have we maybe been perpetrators of subtle acts of exclusion and uh it was it was fascinating it was fascinating to, to do the hard work to hear everybody's voice um and that's what rebuilds really a culture of a company and yeah. it, it's hard but it's incredibly important yeah i know it's great to hear that you guys are kind of taking action and even yeah. just at the beginning stage really trying to understand what it is that makes it difficult so that you can actually create change Exactly. Yeah. And I think people think culture at a company is about having fun and snacks and pool tables and, yeah. <laughs> and, and so on. Maybe one of, maybe part of it, but a little bit. Yeah. yeah snacks are great. Yeah. Um, but I think it is you know, a culture at a company is built on what you tolerate yeah. and, um, and what you don't tolerate is incredibly important. And so when we do that hard work, I grow as a person and it can be emotional at times. I've definitely been on some of those book clubs and I've had to do a lot of kind of soul searching and, yeah. and, and dig deep with myself and, I think that's what makes Susie really special is that it, it's not just about building a fun culture, it's building a hard working culture. Mm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we're all growing as, as people. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously over the last two years, I mean, in general, things have been changing, but over the last two years, we've seen massive change because of the pandemic. So I'm curious to know sort of what you think the biggest change has been in the market research industry directly affected because of the pandemic. Yeah, I would say um, it is speed, speed, speed. <laughs> so <laughs> when I first started working in market research, I had a month to write my survey. I would send it over to the services team. They would say, we'll get you data back in a month. I would have a couple of weeks to put together my PowerPoint presentations, which I would fiddle around with and, uh, and so on. Night and day to where we are today. It is actually push button, push button, push button. Um, and I think it's not just about speed of getting consumers feedback. It's really about removing those bad ideas. Um, gauging what the consumer thinks and feels while you're in a meeting as well. I think mm. a lot of decisions are made um, at companies based on, well, we all live in New York and we think this would be a great product or a great name. Um, and those things, and we don't have time to test it. So I think often bad ideas and kind of group think at a brand can, can be a little dangerous without that consumer feedback. So mm. tools like Suzy and many other agile tools have really enabled brands to get incredibly fast feedback. Um, bring those consumers into that meeting and say, oh, wow, we were, that was way off. That was a really bad idea. Yeah. Or oh, this was an incredible idea. Actually, we need to dig deeper into this particular topic and, uh, and then conduct some more significant research around it. So it's really about enabling companies to, to bring that consumer voice um, to the room much earlier and yeah. much faster. What's maybe one of the, what's maybe the quickest um, insights you can get turnaround wise? So we actually, I ran a, a test just last week for a client who needed incredibly fast feedback. Um, we got 500 completes in 22 minutes. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And our data output now is a stat tested PowerPoint presentation. You click download, it is stat tested to both 90, 95% confidence level. Wow. And I remember <laughs> thinking to myself, I was like, wow, I remember like 15 years ago, laboring over it, this yes. type of power presentation, manually calculating that stat testing in SPSS and uh, kind of working out all of my mathematics around it. And how's I can touch of a button? And I'm what I'm I think I'm what I'm most happy about with that is that not that I wasted, but like I spent a lot of my career in those early days doing that hard task-based kind of work. And I feel like what we are doing is enabling our clients in their careers to to progress much quicker because they're yeah. not having to spend the time on that kind of like very manual yeah. um, manual work. Um, and automating it has really enabled them to grow in their careers quicker. Wow, amazing. So, you know, this is me to my last question. I think it's interesting you mentioned around automation. I'm curious mm -hmm. to see what you think 
the biggest trend in 2022 in market research will be? Um, so I think it is about segmentation. So segmentation okay. for brands has usually been an enormous undertaking. It's normally been a six month project, really understanding consumers and understanding those clusters. It's conducted at great expense, great time. And it's then not updated for kind of three years. Like these are the segments, these are our consumers. Um, and that's changed. So the segmentation work that a lot of our clients did pre-pandemic and even early pandemic, even mid-pandemic, Delta variant pandemic, et cetera, is, it's almost outdated as quickly as it, as it came through. Yeah. Those consumers and those segments have shifted significantly. Um, so I think for 2022, the real key focus for Susie and for many of our clients is we need to segment these consumers faster, quicker, and more frequently because those behaviors um, are shifting on a, on a very, very frequent basis. And people don't fall into just one segment and stay there for three years. It's yeah. really about that shifting, um, shifting needs and shifting mindsets. So I think segmentation and the speed of segmentation is going to be uh, key in 2022. Interesting. Well, I love everyone's had different answers. So that's the first one I've heard around this. So I'm excited to see if that comes yeah. about in 2022. So have you been here before? Yes. Cool. So I'm just uh, we're back now. First year. What was sort of the you know, most favorite thing since being back here? Um, I th <laughs> so I, this is my fourth conference face to face conference of the year. We we everybody shifted them into a very short space of time. So I feel like every two weeks I'm like, oh, hey guys. Um, to everybody, it's, I think we've all become a, a lot more humble. Everyone's hugging more than they've ever hugged before. And, um, and they're, I think, more authentic with kind of like, I've struggled with my mental health. Everybody's feeling very anxious. And we're talking about that. Yeah. And I think that's really important because I think previously we're kind of like, how are you guys? Oh, I'm amazing. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. And I think now it's like, no, I'm really struggling. This is really hard. And it's difficult to get out of my pajamas and think about going to an office and putting shoes on and, um, and, and changing. So, um, so I think everyone's just been a little more real. So it's been awesome. Amazing. Um, Katie, thank you so much for talking thank you for to having me about me. Susie and the insights. It's been great speaking with you. Awesome. Great to be here. Thank, thank you. you.